Today, we will be focusing on the economy of South India in the early medieval period between 600 to 900, when the peninsular India was dominated by the Vatapi Chalukyans, Pallavas and the Pandyans as the main political players. <coughs> the South Indian uh, economy, as we find, pursued different types of activities which included agriculture, artisanal production as well as trade and trade related financial activities. As it is very clear that agriculture took the lion's share and the state also got the lion's share of its revenue from the land revenue. Now, while discussing the economy, we can first look at the condition of the South Indian historiography. In the conventional historiography, the main focus was on the dynastic history and the nature of state as well as economy for looked from the point of view of the dynastic history. Now, this had some benefits, some merits as well as some demerits. To start with, the merit was it gave a very firm chronological background as well as it gave a very strong information base on which the later historians have done enormous amount of interpretation. But the problem was, as it was focused mainly on the political history, the economy became a kind of essentialized version and the change, amount of change that took place was not very well depicted in the conventional historiography. As well as, we find that the discussion on economy was mainly concentrated on the institutional aspects of economy, particularly focusing on the land grants given to different religious functionaries as well as beneficiaries and other aspects of the economy was kept in the background. Now, with this condition, it was also assumed that with the inception of the Pallava and the Pandyan kingdom or kingship, a centralized and bureaucratic organization was coming into being. In the ca case of economy, we find that the, the a new type of inventions were also taking place particularly the irrigation, irrigation and the sluice uh, becoming one of the major technological advances which took place in this period. Despite the advantages of the conventional historiography, it lacked a good framework and that the later historians with new perspectives has brought into being. 
First of all, the modern historians who are opposed to the conventional historiography, they consider that the conventional histori historians as they have posited that the Pallava and the Pandian kingship mainly and Chalukyan kingship as well constituted a kind of break, a kind of disjunction and this resulted in a very sharp economic changes. The new historians they find that the condition was more a gradual transition, gradual change and they also bring in some new perspectives like in the conventional historiography the economic aspects are dealt in uh, isolation. For instance, the temple institution, lot many discussion has been uh, done on the temples, but how to integrate temple with the overall economic activities that was left aside. The new historians or the historians from a new perspective, they find that the activities of the temples as well as the religious institutions, they work for a new kind of integration where the earlier isolated agrarian regions were integrated because of this new uh, activities of the temples, particularly the irrigation aspects and the religious functionaries uh, doing a lot in the case of expansion of irrigation and this led to the lateral expansion of agriculture because most of these irrigational works they were uh, built up in the dry regions and this led to the wet cultivation and naturally this led into a larger integration of the uh, isolated agrarian zones. This also led into the expansion of the resource base of the state. The state which depended on land revenue could now very well depend on the increased amount of uh, production, this resulting in the expansion of the resource base. So, from the new perspective, the economic activity saw a kind of expansion, but it was gradual. It was not a very sharp break from the earlier period. In the earlier period, in the Sangam period, uh, in the Tamil speaking region, there were isolated Marudam zones, which were peasant uh, zones. Now, there was the horizontal or lateral expansion of these peasant zones, which were earlier erstwhile non-peasant zones. They were also getting integrated because of the expansion of the agriculture resulting from the irrigational activities where these, uh, these uh, religious institutions played a very significant role. As well as opposed to the conventional historiography, the new historians, they argue that it was the new kingship which emerged and which according to the conventional historiography was very, very centralized and bureaucratic organization. Compared to the earlier position, these new historians, they are arguing that these uh, institutions, they were much less centralized and their main focus is on some supralocal organizations like Nadu. With this background, with the new perspective that is now gradually emerging in the historiography, then we can shift into the actual working of the uh, economy. In economy, then we can distinguish between several uh, sections. First of all, it is mainly agriculture and then there are the artisanal productions, then there are trade and trade related activities with which we can round up the discussion on agriculture, uh, on economy. At the very beginning, we should make it clear that because of the rich epigraphical sources, it is 
mainly the discussion is mainly focused on the Tamil speaking region. It has produced huge amount of large amount of epigraphical sources from which on the basis of which we can get a good account of, we can give a very good account of the workings of economy. Now, in the case of agriculture, it was village based agriculture that we are speaking of. The villages, they varied in their size. There may be small villages or very big villages comprising of several hem uh, hamlets and divided into several cherries, that is streets. Now, these villages comprised of the agricultural uh, lands, both dry cultivation and wet cultivation lands. Then there were households, house gardens. Along with that, we have uh, the tanks, which comprised a very important uh, aspect, the why that we will discuss later. Then the village waste, commons, cremation grounds and spaces meant for markets. With this, a village con was constituted and it was very well demarcated and earlier we have seen that uh, very good demarcation marks were given so that even now we can identify a village if the situation has not very changed very much. With these uh, markers, another very important uh, aspect has uh, grown in this period, particularly in the Pallava and the Pandian uh, region, that is the Brahmin villages, the kings, royal family members, as well as later some of the important feudatories and the officials, they granted lands to the Brahmin donis which constituted the Brahmadeya, that is the villages owned by either an individual or a group of Brahmins. These villages, as they were granted with the Sarvamanya land and they were exempted from payment of uh, revenue that the other villages paid, the normal um, common villages paid, these villages were generally much well endowed, very, very rich villages. Apart from these uh, villages, we find that there were uh, land tenors and temples also played a very significant role in the economic life. Whenever the land was granted to the temples, that is Devadana, the temples played a very significant role in the economy of the village. The temple had a group of, a range of ritual specialists who were known as Koil Parivaram. And apart from that, the villagers, the common villagers, they had to contribute a certain amount of grain, certain amount of produce for upkeep of the temple which was known as Magamai. Along with that, during the festival days, special grants were made to the temples so that the temple could defray the cost of a huge amount of people congregating in the uh, festival days and the temple had to take charge of feeding these congregating people. So, the temple also had a very significant role in the economy of the village wherever they existed. Apart from these religious functionaries, there were several layers of, several types of land ownership that can be found from the inscriptional evidences.
some of them, not all, some of the members of the village, they had proprietary rights on lands. That is, they were not only enjoying the usufruct, that is the produce of the land, but they could dispose of either sale or give the land in gift to some person whom he or they liked. So, there were a group of people who were enjoying the land as their own, their own, um, uh, they were enjoying the ownership of the land as well as there were tenants, tenants of different types. Another very important aspect also arises from the study of the inscriptional evidences that is a group in the later Pallava grants who appear very significantly, the Vigyapti, they were absent in the earlier Pallava charters. In the earlier Pallava charters, the king and the royal family members play the most significant role in the grant of land to the temple or the Brahmin uh, beneficiary. These later Pallava charters that we refer to, particularly from the Nandivarman Pallava Malla, uh, Pal uh, Nandivarman Pallava Malla's reign, particularly in the Kasakudi grant or Pattatal Mangalam grant, there we find a few a group of feudatory or important royal officials, they play the most significant role in the grant of land. They apply to, they submit to the king for grant of the land tax free to a uh, doni mostly the Brahmin Doni and then on the basis of their application, the king grants or relinquishes his income from the tax that could accrue from that village or the group of villagers. So, the Vigyapti becomes most important in the later Pallava grants who were earlier absent in the uh, former or the earlier Pallava grants. Other type of land uh, ownership or rights to the land is also important. Though the Brahmins and the temples, they were granted with the land, it does not mean that they were given the ownership. Mostly they were enjoying the usufruct, right to enjoy the fruits of the soil. Different types of names were given. Archana Bhoga, Deva Bhoga Hala, which means the arable land which has been granted to the temple. So, it meant that they could enjoy the fruits of the soil, but there is not a single instance where the doni could dispose of the land or the grant as per his or their wish. They could enjoy it on hereditary basis, but they could not part with that particular land or uh, grant if they wanted to. From the Kilputtur inscription of Kampavarman, we also come across different types of tenurial rights. For instance, we come across the term Payal Neelam. Payal means half, Neelam is land, which means the fruits of the soil, the uh, produce could be equally divided, at least in this case, equally divided between the owner and the tenant. Then we have the term like Adainilam. Adainilam is the king's share, 
which we are not very sure because uh, no clear reference to the king's share has been done or the quantification of the king's share has been done. But it seems from the extant uh, treaties that it varied between one sixth to one tenth. Then we have Karainilam, which means the tenants were periodically shifted. The Donis who enjoyed the Brahmadeya or Devadana, they could not part with their uh, grant as I have referred already. It is very clear from the term Paradatti which means that they were granted, it was a grant and it was not a permanent right to the particular land. With this, we come across a layered society where at the very top there were the state functionaries, they had the right or they could dispose of their, uh, their soil or part of their income from the soil. Then there was a group of intermediaries that was growing up particularly in the form of the Vigyapti or the land owners, the Vellalas or the very substantial agriculturists that were uh, growing up, a uh, stratum that was growing up and beneath there were the peasants who actually cultivated the soil. The peasants were known by different names. In Sanskrit, they were known as Kudumbi. In Tamil, they were either known as Kudi or sometimes they were known as Kudi Makkal. In one instance, we find reference to Ahambadi Udayan, which also would mean a kind of peasants who cultivated the soil. So, it was a layered society and this society was coming into being. Mm -hmm.